Well, happy Sabbath. To those of you who are worshipping with us and not Seventh-day Adventists, that may have sounded a little bit strange. But welcome to the house of the Lord on this, our Sabbath day, the day we spend with the Lord. We thank you so much for coming to worship with us today. I was not sure how many would be here, but God has truly blessed us with a just about a full house. Thank you for coming to spend this, this very important moment with our beautiful Lord. There are two special people here today, and uh, not many of you will get to have this milestone, but John and Paula, will you please stand up? You are to be honoured and exalted. They have just celebrated 65 years of married life. And... Uh, if you, if, you were, if you were to read the little letter that they just gave to us, uh, there's a lot more life left yet, I can tell you. I can tell you. That's uh, just absolutely amazing. God bless you, John and Paula. It is something worthy of being acknowledged. He has. God bless you and he will continue to bless you. I don't know how you feel today. Easter Sabbath is the one Sabbath I feel most uncomfortable to preach. For I'm challenged to preach about a subject that I know very little, and yet I have read much. I have studied what Scripture has to say about it. But every time, every year when the, this weekend comes around, I learn more and I learn more. And I begin to realize that I know nothing. I know nothing of the significance of this event. But one thing I know, that it has touched me. That it has touched me. And that's why I'm here. That's why I'm standing before you today, because it has touched me. If it had not touched me, I would just be like most other people. Couldn't care less. But I thank God that you have been touched as well because you are here. And I thank God that he has touched you. But I want to take you back 1,985 years when the greatest terrorist act of all history took place when the very kingdom of God came under attack and the hostility of evil was put on one man. We have seen terrorism at work this week and in years gone by, we have seen terrorism at work, but nothing like 1,985 years ago, when all the natural elements of the earth were shaken because of what had happened. Because of the outpouring of evil, God was touched. And heaven was moved, the earth was moved, the sun was moved, all the elements of the earth were touched by the climactic event. How has it touched you? How has it touched you personally? Has it rocked your boat? Has it shaken your world? Has it touched your life? Let's go. Let's go to Friday of Easter weekend. The cross. The cross carried the Son of God. The Son of Man, Jesus, Emmanuel, was nailed to a cross. Nine a.m. in the morning, the nails were driven through his hands and his feet, and he was bound to a cross. At the very time when the innocent lamb was to be slain, 
as the daily sacrifice for the people of Israel, the innocent lamb, Jesus Christ, was nailed to a cross. And unbeseen in human history, six hours later, he died at three o'clock, the time that the evening lamb was to be slain. Jesus died. Nobody had died on a cross before in less than six, seven days. The expectation of life on a cross was more like 12 to 14 days. But the weight of evil, the weight of the world upon Jesus was so heavy that it suffocated him to death in six hours. And so Friday evening came. And at the request of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, two unexpected individuals who had been touched by Jesus begged with Pilate for Jesus to be taken off the cross. And so, yes, they take Jesus off that cross before the sun sets and they placed him in the tomb. They placed him in the tomb and under the watchful eye of Roman centurions, he was sealed in that tomb. And so, after the blood was spilt there on Calvary, on Saturday, the cross stood naked. The innocent sufferer for mankind was resting, was resting in the tomb. Resting to seal our salvation. He rested. And thank you, ladies, for bringing us to Sunday morning. The Sabbath, first of all, the Sabbath draws near. The work of embalming could not be completed. And that, just think a moment, the pain in those ladies that came down here this morning, just think of the pain in their lives. We rejoice at the cross. They were not rejoicing. Their dearest friend, their, the one they loved the most, the one who had cared for them the most, the one who had healed, the one who had touched lives, had been stolen away from them. They were in pain. They were feeling like the people in Belgium, torn apart, heavy hearts, no joy, nothing but sadness. And so dejected they come on that Sunday morning to embalm Jesus. He was the one worthy of being embalmed and being treated rightfully in death. But even he was not treated rightfully in death and was laid to rest much quicker than he should have been. But the Sabbath... Jesus is in the sealed tomb. And the devil was rejoicing. Evil was rejoicing. I have the victory. The tomb is sealed. And so for 24 hours, the devil rejoiced. The devil celebrated. But not the loved ones of God. They were in bitter sadness. Deep sadness. But then Sunday morning came around. First the ladies find the empty tomb. Then the disciples, and now they are traumatized more than ever. Where is he? Where did my Savior go? Where did my Jesus go? the one who's going to restore rightful things to this place. Where has he gone? We need him. And so there's more anguish, there is more pain, there is more suffering, for they don't understand. They don't understand. And today not many people understand as well. 
We focus so often on the cross. We focus so often on the cross because it brings us our salvation. It sets us free from sin. But I want to tell you, if Jesus was still in the grave, you might as well go home. You might as well not be here. For the cross only paid the price for our sin. But it didn't fully set us free. For Jesus has more things to do than just die on a cross. And so we asked the question Sunday, three days later, where did he go? Where did he go? The tomb on Sunday morning, under the watchful eye of heaven, the stone is taken away by the angel Gabriel. The centurions are blinded. by the brightness of the angelic host that comes to set the Lord free. But then on that Sunday morning, he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. Not stolen, not hidden, but rose from the dead. And on that Sunday morning, To the one who understood him the most, he came first. Mary was truly the only individual prior to his death that had a comprehension of who he was. That's why she went to town. That's why she she used her life savings to buy that alabaster bottle of, of anointing oil. Because she understood who Jesus was. And that he was worthy of being anointed as the king of Israel. And so she spends her life savings and anoints him. And to that one who really understood who Jesus was. He comes first. He comes first. Mary. Mary. It's I. He had been transformed into the glorious Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. She did not first immediately recognize who he was, but when she heard his voice, she sensed that it was Jesus, Jesus. She reaches out to touch him, and she, he says, Uh-oh, no, Mary, not yet. I have not yet ascended to my Father. You know, I often wondered why the story of Peter walking on water is told in the Bible. It's there for a reason. It's there for a reason. For Jesus to ascend to his Father, he had to defy something. He had to defy gravity. He had to defy all the natural laws of our existence. He had to defy gravity to ascend to his Father. And he'd already showed us that he was capable because he had defied gravity. Earlier on, he had walked on water. And Jesus showed us that he was already the conqueror of natural laws. And so on that Sunday morning, he, he goes to his father. Mary was the one who got the lowdown on where Jesus was going. Wouldn't you have loved to have been Mary? What a, what a joy that would have been to have been there with that risen Jesus. Imagine a heart. Wow. Wow. It would be like it was hit with a defibrillator. Man, there would have been joy in her soul. And then he wanted Peter and John to know, go tell them. Go tell the guys. Go tell them. And they didn't have to wait long. They didn't have to wait long. Later that day, Jesus appeared to them. And then over the next 40 days, Jesus stays in close contact with those disciples. 
He stays in close contact, comforting, bringing them hope, having them understand the significance of the resurrection. Oh, guys, it's not about an earthly kingdom. This is about God's eternal kingdom. This is why I came, and only now were they able to make sense of what Jesus was all about, about establishing the kingdom of God. And so we still ask the question, and many people do, where did he go? Well, in Acts chapter 1, we get the picture of the ascension of Christ. Forty days after his resurrection, he ascends into the presence of God. Let's have a read of Acts 1, 9 to 11. Acts 1, 9 to 11. After he had said these things, he was lifted up. And while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight, and as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They said, men of Galilee. And at this point, it's not just the disciples. It's believed that this crowd of people is in excess of 500 people. There's a multitude of witnesses to this event. This is just not a made-up story of the disciples. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So there is a prophecy of another event yet to happen in the life of Jesus Christ. It doesn't finish with the cross. It moves on from there. But I want to take you to this, this point here, this, this verse. Come to this verse. This is one of the most powerful verses in Scripture. One of the most powerful verses in Scripture, and it comes from a book that sadly not, pe not many people spend a lot of time with. The book of Hebrews is a powerful book and it argues that Jesus is better than anything else that's been, that's ever been. Jesus is better than anything. And eight times you will have through the book of Hebrews arguments for the betterness of Jesus and this and this and this. It's a powerful book. But here in Hebrews 4 verse 14, this is something that beautifully happens for God's people. Therefore... Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confessions. This passage of Scripture is telling us that Jesus is no longer on this earth. He's moved through the heavens. He's gone through the, the levels of heaven, the atmospheric heaven, the starry heavens, and he's gone into the very heaven, the dwelling place of God. He's gone there. He hasn't gone there to just watch sport on TV. He's gone there as a high priest, as the representative of God's people and the presence of God. In the holy place of God where God's people cannot be, you and I have our representative, Jesus Christ. For 1,500 years thereabouts, the sinners of Israel would have to come to the high priest or to the priest. And they would have to spill their story to the priest and they would have to say, look, 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 priest, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. Uh, yeah, what do I do? How do I fix the problem? And the priest would say, okay, oh, that's, that you need to give a grain offering or you need to um, kill a dove or you need to give a lamb. And the, the, the priest would, 
would list out what needed to be done so forgiveness could be done. So that the sins of the people could be taken into the presence of God in the tabernacle. And that went on for over 1,500 years. But the day came when after the death of Jesus on a cross, having fulfilled all the requirements of priesthood, Jesus became our priesthood. Jesus became our priest in the heaven of God. And so we no longer go to a man and say, what do I do? How do I fix my problem? What do I have to do for my sins to be covered? We don't have to do that anymore because our sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus. We just now go to Jesus and say, Jesus, look, Jesus, I made the biggest mistake of my life today and I am so sorry. I don't know how to fix it. I can't fix it, Jesus. And Jesus will say, it's okay, I'll fix it. Because he's fixed it. We trust in Jesus. That's where he's gone. He's gone into the very presence. You know, on that very sad night when he was preparing himself for death, he said something beautiful to the disciples in John 14, 1 to 3. In John 14, 1 to 3, this is what Jesus said in the saddest moment, only hours before his death. He said this to his disciples. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, and if it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. 1,985 years ago, before the greatest terrorist act in the history of the universe, Jesus said to his disciples, don't worry, guys. Something ugly is going to happen. But don't worry, I've got it sorted. I'm going to go to my Father. I'm going to prepare a place so that you can be there too. Just be ready. Just be ready for when I've done that and I'll come and get you. That's where he went. It's all about us. It's all for us. And everything that Jesus has done is for us. I don't know why it's jumping too. Here we have a beautiful picture of Jesus the high priest overlooking a church. For if it were not for the church, the story of Jesus the sacrifice, the story of Jesus the lamb, the story of Jesus becoming our high priest would not be told. Thank God we have a church that is able to tell the good news, to preach the good news that Jesus Christ is our representative. Jesus Christ is our high priest. If you want to say it to yourself, Jesus Christ, my high priest. My high priest. And the church is his representative. The church represents him here on earth today to lead people to understand the beauty of Jesus Christ. You know, death is usually a bitter pill that we swallow. It's not a pleasant experience at all, death. The death of Jesus was not a bitter pill. It's the best medicine that we could ever have. And we, fear, we do not fear in death because of what happened with our wonderful Jesus. It's jumping too. I don't know why. I'm not hitting it that hard. Come further on into the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9 verses 11 and 12. If you've got some quiet time this afternoon, just read the book of Hebrews. Don't try and understand it. Just read it as if somebody was sitting there reading it to you. Just just read it and get the whole picture. It is a beautiful story 
It's a single sermon given on the benefits of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, 11 and 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. Jesus Christ has gone into the holiness of God, to the throne room of God. I'll give you a picture in a moment of what that looks like. And he says he did this not through the blood of goats and calves, doves and all these other things that we mentioned earlier, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place for all, having obtained eternal redemption. That holy place is the place where sin meets its end. It is where sin meets meets the holiness of God. But because the righteous one, Jesus, who shed his blood for you and I is is standing there, we can be found worthy in the presence of Jesus. Just for a moment, Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 5. The, one of the most beautiful pictures of, in the Bible of God and of Jesus. And when you open your Bible to Revelation chapter 5, there's a problem. Heaven is sad. Heaven is, is distraught. Heaven is in a delicate situation. Who? Who is going to solve the problems of the world? Solve the problems of heaven? For sin even touches the presence of God. And so when you come into Revelation 5, there is mourning, there is weeping in heaven. Look in verse 1 of chapter 5. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. This book is the future of the Christian church. This book is the future of the world as told through the book of Revelation. Who's going to open this book? Who's going to reveal to the world what is to come? Verse 2, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And verse 3, and no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. And then look at verse 4. Then I began to weep greatly. Imagine, this is in heaven, folks. This is not down here where sin is in all of its power. This is in the courts of God. There's weeping. Heaven, the presence of God was being touched with the reality of where human life was. I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open and to look. And one of the elders, and we we haven't got time to go into all of this. I'd love to have time. But these elders are those who were resurrected from the dead at the same time that Christ was to be witnesses. These were influential people that God brought from their graves to tell the story that Jesus is true that Jesus is real, that he is who he is. And the Jews would more likely believe those people than the words of Jesus himself. And so Jesus brought these eyewitnesses and for their blessings, for, for doing what they did, they were taken to heaven. And when the, uh, when the, The powers that be in heaven say, who is worthy? One of these human representatives steps up 
in verse 5 and said, Stop weeping! Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the little book. And then what is seen next? What is seen next? Verse 6, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb, a lamb standing, as if slain, having the seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out on all the earth. Standing in full perfection is Jesus Christ, the lamb that was slain. Heaven rejoices. Heaven celebrates. Are you rejoicing today? Are you celebrating today? Because the lamb, the lion of the tribe of Judah, has gotten the victory, has overcome, has been slain from the foundations of the world. You know, I don't think these pictures do justice. This is a human being trying to, to explain the, the grandeur and the glory of God, and I don't think we can do it. But 10,000 times 10,000 angels... It's phenomenal. And be, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round the thrones and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And I want to say today, friends, that that Jesus is worthy. I uphold Jesus before you today and say that he is worthy. I'm pleased that person dressed there by Jesus is not looking at you. For it would have a face. But it's not. It's looking away from you. That picture can be you. Can be me. Can be you. That picture can be any one of you. But that is the ministry of Jesus today. Jesus is representing, Jesus is presenting his people in the presence of a holy God. And whoever has confessed Jesus will be presented to a holy God. And Jesus will say, Father, this is your son. Father, this is your daughter. They have come home. And the father's not going to say, hey, hang on, but I can remember them pinching a bar of chocolate. We talked about this in Sabbath school. Only this morning. The father's not going to say, oh, I can remember that kid pinching a bar of chocolate. And he doesn't deserve to be here. And even if he did, Jesus would say, but hang on, father. That sin's nailed to the cross. That sin, father, I paid the price. Let the child go. What a beautiful God. What a loving God. Let's come back to Acts 1, 9 to 11. For the story doesn't end with Easter. And I'm not sure if today is even the day that Jesus died 1,985 years ago. It's more than likely around about the 14th to the 16th of April is the actual death date of Jesus, but no one really has that locked down. But it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's, it's great that we celebrate it sometime. But I want to say a word of warning. If next week you forget about this, you've missed the point. For a lamb died daily for the sins of Israel. Jesus doesn't, does not have to die daily. He only had to die once. But we need to die daily. We have to die to sin every day. Sin is powerful. Sin is all conquering if there is not somebody 
better than us to deal with it. That someone is Jesus. But these angels who saw Jesus go into the heavens reminds us of something else, that this Jesus is going to come back. He hasn't finished yet. There are seven important elements to the ministry of Jesus. His incarnation, his coming down from heaven, his sinless life. If he were not sinless, he could not have died on a cross. There's his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his high priestly ministry, and his coming as the king. Without any one of them, the story is incomplete. And so it is here in Acts chapter 1 verse 9, at the time when Jesus went to heaven, that the heavenly messengers said to us in verse 11, Men of Galilee, people of Alstonville, people of Canada, people of Eight Mile Plains, wherever else you are, why stand just gazing up, wondering where did he go? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go. As the clouds received him, so the clouds will bring him back to those who have trusted in his death, believed in his resurrection, believed in his ascension, but more importantly, believe that in the holy place of God, your sins have been wiped away and you can stand there righteous in the presence of a holy God. It's not going to be long, friends. We'll see the face of God. We'll see the face of the Father. But I'm ever so thankful that we have seen a picture of God in Jesus. This same Jesus will come again and be to us our Savior. Let's have a look at Hebrews 9, 28, and this is the last text for the morning. Hebrews 9, 28. Paul pulls it all together here. The author of Hebrews pulls it all together. 1,985 years ago, a child who was born 34 years before that died and was placed in that tomb. He came the first time. And let's have a look at what this text has to say. So Christ, also having been offered on a cross to bear the sins of many. So once upon a time, just over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came and died on a cross to bear the sins of many. All who are willing, he bears those sins. But then it goes on to say, look at it, look what it says in the rest of this verse. He will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin because sin is already dealt with to those who eagerly await for him. Oh, this is my prayer today. That you don't forget to eat. That you don't forget to go to work on Tuesday. Don't go to work on Monday unless you absolutely have to. Don't forget to sleep. Don't forget to do what you need to do to survive. But never forget that he's coming back. Live life in the expectation that you will soon see Jesus. And whether it's Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever day of the week, it won't matter. All those issues will pale into insignificance when Jesus comes. Be ready for when Jesus comes. Thank you for the opportunity of sharing with you today where he went. 
and I rejoice in that Jesus is alive and alive forevermore. And Revelation gives us the picture that he also has the keys to death. He'll open anyone's tomb who is resting in Jesus. Father God, thank you. Thank you and thank you. Thank you for Jesus. And thank you, Jesus. Yes, thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done, for being willing to fulfill the Father's will, to live out all that Isaiah chapter 53 had to say, and you did it in a humble heart and a gentle, lamb-like spirit. Thank you, Jesus. But I thank you now that you are living, that you're in the presence of the Father and that soon we will be there with you because that is your desire. That is what you want. Hold on to us, Jesus, and help us hold on to you and trust and believe in you. Bless our fellowship meal together, we pray too. Bless the food that we will share in Thank you for your generous gifts to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.